Cyberpunk 2077 is the long-awaited sequel to Fallout 2076, and as a product represents the entire economic output of the country of Poland. In this game, you play as the cyberpunk Keanu Reeves' biggest fan, who creates a tulpa of Keanu Reeves that haunts him for the duration of the game. Now a team, the true and shadow Keanu strive to eke out a living in the dangerous yet rewarding Night City, offering the very best in Californian living conditions. Together, you navigate the dark streets, glitzing high-rises, and mangled faces of this beautiful metropolis, seeking riches and glory as proud members of Hamas. Under the yoke of crushing poverty, systematic oppression, and runaway monopolies, you stand as Night City's final bastion of defense against a shady underworld of business executives, mercenaries, and caps, and every single kind of ethnicity in existence. Daring to strike back, it's up to you, and you alone, and you and Keanu Reeves, to navigate this scary world together yourself, and to get to the bottom of who the when is where, on top of the sixth, the near, whenever, and build this city on rock and roll. But to understand Cyberpunk 2077, you must understand the world of Night City. Night City is a dangerous place where the internet no longer exists due to nuclear viruses, forcing people to stand up and socialize for entertainment. This has far-reaching consequences on society and has resulted in a decadent morass where the poor are forced to rob you for fun. Crime is at an all-time high, advertisements are in the water, and on top of that, everybody is a cyborg with the equivalent speed of a fucking xenomorph. As a result, the city is populated by a series of stereotypical gangs that you can't join or have quests with. Come on guys, even Todd got this right. These consist of the animals who are buff berated broskies who could break my bitch of a back without busting a fucking breath. Maelstrom who are Adeptus Mechanicus, Moxes, who are ethical cock destroyers and suited up giga prostitutes in charge of worker co-op strip clubs, the Voodoo Boys, who are pissed off radical Haitian separatists dedicated to the destruction of the white man, Tiger Claws, who are the bargain bin Yakuza, Valentinos, a generic Hispanic gang who, according to the wiki, have no goals other than seducing women, the Sixth Street Gang, who are just groipers, and finally, the Scabs, who are Slavic vaporwave enthusiasts that specialize in kidnapping and harvesting your organs. It therefore really disappoints me when I figured out that I could only interact with these gangs about three times each. Their primary purpose is to be repeatedly fucked with without any consequence. I am simply fucking surprised that not even a basic faction system exists. I once did a favor for a corporate agent in the main quest, and the far-reaching consequences of my decision was that I had sex with her. That's it. Speaking of corporations, Night City is a place where corporations have run completely amok, and are involved in every single level of government through lobbying, which isn't corruption because it has a different name, guys. In the world of cyberpunk, billionaires are free to coup as many Bolivian governments as they please. That lithium isn't going to mine itself. Exploit convict slave labor to make hand soap. Make Taiwanese labor laws worse. Engage in literal wars. And also mind control the mayor. That's a quest. All hospitals and ambulances are privatized, and you can pay for the deluxe package to arm your paramedics. You paid to go to that hospital, and goddammit, you're gonna fucking get there. Ultimately, the lore and setting of Cyberpunk 2077 is the best aspect of the game by far. You can tell just by looking at every single crevice of the city that a poor Polish femboy slave spent hours modeling every goddamn recycle bin until his hands bled. The game really sells you on the feeling of being in a crack den and buying Xanax wrapped in a cassette tape and stapled onto a guy's face. Even the most basic side quest areas make Dark Souls 2 look like it's designed by ants. When someone tells me this game took 8 years to develop, this is why I believe them. The game runs especially well if you have a computer designed to fight God and nothing else. But as controversial as this game's PERFORMANCE is, it can be universally agreed that the music fucking slaps. This game is jam-packed with the most goddamn amazing copyright-free music I have ever seen. All of it sounds like the realistic, as if it is the music of the exist in the fiber skunk world. You got the classic metal, rock, rage, Game. And Grimes. Grimes is in this fucking game. This is the closest I will ever get to reaching Elon and telling him to stop killing people for lithium. I can only imagine a dude in CDPR HQ talking to a suit like, Sir, it is imperative to the success of the game that you allow me to create dank reggae music. But now that you're aware of the world of Hyperfuck 2077, it's time to get into the combat. When you first play the game, the gameplay mechanics won't seem that complex, and every enemy is kind of a bullet sponge. This will persist until you unlock the gigantic mantis blades that protrude from your arms and fly 50 feet forward into most enemies like a xenomorph. This is the only goddamn RPG besides Skyrim where melee isn't just viable, it's fucking optimal. I didn't even try to hack or do stealth after I figured this out. Ultimately, the game isn't afraid to let you break it in terms of damage numbers and lets you experiment with maybe two or three different main specializations on top of the basic shooter gameplay. If you stick to a basic rifle and try to do something like aim at enemies like a fucking idiot, you're gonna have a bad Time. So what I recommend is stacking crit damage over several orders of magnitude with a revolver and insta-killing every single enemy you see. Any shooter that encourages you to be mobile in a fight is more fun than sitting in a corner and plinking, and Cyberpunk gives a lot of incentives to move. Cyberpunk is also a game where you not only modify skills in a tree, but metal in a body, such as passive bonuses that I don't care about, and the goddamn gorilla arms, do I need to say more? You can return to monkey. Although, when it comes to all these different weapons and specializations, it seems that there isn't much variety in how you specialize. Whatever happened to Skyrim giving an entire skill tree dedicated to just being a werewolf? Tech pistol? 
pistol, smart pistol, stupid pistols, revolvers, burst fire, have bonuses for all of them or none of them. The combat is fun, but there isn't that much to it, which is why it reminds me of Borderlands. There's also the driving gameplay, and it feels like ice skating on a pool of frozen lubricant and dozens of ropes are in the way. Cars have the stopping distance of several fucking city blocks and want to drift for literally every turn. It is faster in this game to delete your save file and create a new one if you want to travel back to your fucking house. This is because Night City ran out of rubber in the year 2040, and have subsequently been making tires out of the increasingly rotted corpse of the Michelin Man. When it comes to the open world or dynamic gameplay, I'm really glad that it didn't take the GTA 5 route where you play tennis once and then get fucking bored. Mr. Boss for the win here, and in this video, I'm going to be showing you guys a full-length tennis match. Instead, the game saturates itself with small, numerous side quests where 90% of the time you're paid to go somewhere, kill everyone, and then leave with no nuance. The side quests are the dynamic gameplay. This isn't a game where you go hunting. My biggest issue with the entire game thus far is that the side quests are either William Shakespeare fucking masterpieces, or they have micro stories that are summarized in two sentences. Let's walk through a side quest. You go to drive a weird guy somewhere, he gets out of the car, goes to the store, oh no, he actually robbed the store, then you kill everyone, congrats, the quest is over, no further development, fuck you. I would trade eight of these fucking quests to get a decent one. It's like you're playing a weird mixture between Fallout New Vegas and a Ubisoft game. The Witcher 3 had something similar, but in The Witcher 3 I was actually surprised sometimes. Let's look at the better half of this. There are side quests that are fucking eight missions long. You learn the entire backstory for an ensemble of enterprising actors and then crucify them on live television. I can't stress enough how actually godlike the writing for these quests are. When the developers decide to write words, an impressive cop. There is a side quest in this game involving a meticulous search with a skilled detective to track down and locate a serial killer using only your wits. An underground battle for control of a strip club from the clutches of organized crime. And a complex family feud in a biker gang. Or I can play the same murder spree in a single room 16 fucking times! This game is like reading six dirty copies of War and Peace, and then every 20 pages you have to stare at cardboard. Imagine for a moment that you're a Militech guard in the beautiful Night City. You see this weird guy running down the street wearing 14 different colors like a goddamn clown, when suddenly his arms open up like a fucking alien to reveal two gigantic sword-like appendages, and he leaps directly into you from 15 feet away. Your buddy goes to shoot him, but instead of fighting back, the fucker disassembles an entire rifle in front of him. And once he's done killing everyone, he sits perfectly still for 24 hours straight. That is the true open-world experience. Do you remember playing Fallout New Vegas and having so many interesting little elements to the quests and their effect on the world that you never had to find the fun? Well, most of Crying Trunk's quests had me going, oh yeah, this is a video game. I never felt like these quests improved my relationship with Freeside or helped the NCR. They were just there to waste my time. In fact, let's stop comparing things to Fallout New Vegas forever, since it's the perfect game. Don't let Todd hear about this conversation. That aside, there are a good 30 to 40 hours of meaningful content in this game. You don't have to do all the gigs, uh, unless you're reviewing the game then you might just have to. Night City also suffers from an issue where all the police are in a state of quantum superposition where they are both far away and nearby at all times. Meaning, if a citizen were to commit a crime, the cops would simply quantum tunnel directly outside their cone of vision. This is because the aforementioned Michelin droughts of 2040 caused the police to give up driving entirely. There is no driving AI in the game. Nobody can drive, not even you. This is why the cops teleport, because they can't actually drive to the scene of crime, so the game pretends you don't notice, but you fucking notice. It just makes the world feel kind of dumb and not that reactive. It's not fun to commit crimes in night fucking city. There aren't enough dynamic mechanics to make the world feel alive, which is fine, but the picosecond quests aren't filling the fucking gap. No. Which is a shame, because the world design almost does! I'm not going to forget about Little Japan's shitty alleyways filled with hollow prostitutes, Watson's red glow at night, the Badlands rotting windmills, or how in Pacifica they want me dead for killing that innocent girl in 2004. So when you're done with your first 40 hours of epic adventures, daring escapes, and thrilling car chases, the game doesn't seem to have enough to keep me playing. But let's rewind for a moment to talk about what makes those first 40 hours satisfying and fun. Spoilers for the rest of the video. I've saved this part for last, in case you're a child or seeing this 10 years from now after Mechaji's world takeover. In which case, Chu Chu Nibia Xiao Wu. Like The Witcher 3, the main quest is actually not written by gorillas. In the years following Skyrim's release, Polish scientists were able to extract and locate the hidden element known as being fucking subtle, and are mostly able to apply it to the world of Cyberpunk 2077. The game is willing to stop and give you quiet moments with the characters, as if they're written to be like people, and not the apes that live near Ubisoft Montreal. Speaking of characters, the main quest is primarily 
originally comprised of V, the world's last schizophrenic, and Keanu Reeves, who plays as himself. And even then, he's improperly cast. Are you still rolling? It's hard to see Keanu as a super badass through his overacting voice, but that's okay because the game does everything else in its power to make sure that you think he is badass, and it works. The sections where you play as Johnny are straight-up power fantasies where you use Keanu's dashing looks to invoke the mythical female orgasm. The story of Fiber Junk is one where the true and shadow Keanu begin in opposition, but through a slow web of corporate entanglements, gang warfare, and strip club participation, learn to love one another and grow as people, except only Johnny grows as a person. This is for the best, because V can look like Peter Griffin, and goddammit, I want to roleplay as Peter fucking Griffin. The game also introduces villains that I love and can understand their fuck mentality. For most villains, like Placide, you don't even think of them as villains, just people acting in their own interests, like Stalin. Cyberpunk is able to effectively frame its struggles as a story of survival, of personal interest against what is truly right, which is why I can sympathize with Johnny for causing 9-11. And though I don't agree, I can totally understand Saburo's decision to melt those orphans into useful paper. That got me motivated to stop him. The mentality of these people uniquely corresponds to the wider world, one where human life means nothing, and everyone is out for themselves. Just like America. What I didn't appreciate is that through the game, the main quest gives you a false sense of urgency, when there is none. Peter Griffin repeatedly suffers from schizophrenic episodes that cause his eyeballs to enter screensaver mode. Every single character in existence urges you to finish the story and save your life as fast as possible, but it will never matter until the plot decides that it matters. If you do all of the side quests, B is the equivalent of a sickly paper bag carrying a shotgun with 50 hydraulic toasters attached, and one of those toasters used to be a rock star before a geriatric Japanese man ate his soul. The game insists that you're weak and dying when in reality you've killed thousands of people at the fucking hospital window and it's jarring. Lastly, people are mad online that you can't continue after the main quest because they are wombats. And if you fuckers somehow convince CDPR to patch in a post-game, I will eat a cricket on camera. Is this game worth your money? Probably. Unless you have a PS4, in which case you've already been sent to the Black Pit of Shale, from which you will never return. I'd like to thank the monetary contributions of the oil barons and media conglomerates that fund my channel and keep it operational. If you would like to contribute your blood diamond money harvested from the recesses of African child labor, you can head to my Patreon to learn more. Thank you all for watching, and of course, death to Arasaka, paid for by Miltech.